three, two, one. Hello, everybody. All right, I'm back. It's only been a day, but you know what? I'm not, uh, I don't have a lot of time before the game comes out, and I got a lot of songs to get over, so, um, or go over. Get over it, man. Uh, so well, let's start with the, the beginning here. Um, the title screen. I told you I was going to get into some music this time. I hear some music. music. I'm hearing some music. I think. Man. Setup's been giving me a lot of guff today. I'm not really sure what my format is yet, so I'm just going to play the song. Not that long. Alright, so that's basically the intro song for Venture Kid. And, um, probably no surprise uh, that there's a bit of a Mega Man 3 title screen influence on that track. Uh, that was on purpose. Um, Mega Man 3, in my opinion, has got to have the greatest intro theme song that has ever existed before. Uh, I'm just trying to find it right now in my... NSF library can't quite oh, okay that was my problem Mega Man 3 let's rock that yeah how's that for a killer so not this part obviously but the part coming up directly after this that's where I started taking my uh, my cues Here we go. It's actually not that similar. Now that I'm listening to it. And there's actually some 50% duty cycle in there. Who knew? But you know what? Alright, so, um, before I go on to that one, uh, there was, uh, a series that Capcom made called, uh, Destiny of the Emperor, or An Emperor, I'm not sure, but, uh, it was based on Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese history of, like, Lu Bu and all those, like, warlords from, I'm not even sure what time period, but, um, so Destiny of an Emperor was a NES RPG made by Capcom, of all companies, that, uh, was based on those characters, and there was a sequel that I don't think ever came out in the West, but thanks to the magic of NSFs and using Winamp and plugins like Not-So-Fatso or whatever you prefer, um, we can listen to just the music from some of these games. So here's uh, Destiny of an Emperor 2. I believe it's the title screen, I'm not sure. So you hear the way those two square waves, um, at the start. The way they're combining is what I wanted to, uh, recapture here. I wanted the exact, sort of, I wanted a very Capcom sound, and the only way to really do that is to dissect, uh, soundtracks that they'd already made and figure out how they got that sound. So this was my, my attempt at that. There's a good one. See, I don't really have a format here, so I'm, I'm figuring it out as I go. I'm, t I'm s kind of flustered right now. Don't know exactly where to begin, um, but that's, that's as good a start as any. That was the, um, I wanted a Capcom sound, so in my head I'm thinking Mega Man 3 intro, but obviously um, I didn't even use the 50% duty cycle, so I guess I, uh, I didn't even really achieve that, but I know I did reference this game and this particular track. Mm -hmm. 
so you know it's similar i'm not i'm not uh stealing riffs or whatever but i want that tonality so it's similar to uh like looking over a, a guy's shoulder while he's playing synth and and seeing like oh he's got his uh envelope set up this way i'm, I'm gonna try that when i get home so i kind of did that so i could get that capcom sound um and then remember me telling you uh last time about how the triangle has to be on or off here's another um so I'm going to start explaining things as I go now, I guess. And uh, one of the techniques that I use to to simulate NES triangle waves even closer, I know last time I showed you guys this symbol here, which cuts off uh, a note, but it cuts it off as soon as the line. So as soon as uh, you go from this line to this line, it cuts it off. So there's a technique with this SC1 here. And what do they call that? It's uh, SC is a note cut, and then 1 is the... Uh, the time that it, it takes after it hits this line to cut the note. So it's basically saying instead of this, where it cuts the note off right here, it's saying, okay, cut the note off here plus one tick. And what A03 is, is saying that each line is worth three ticks. So it's, it's basically what an SC1 is, is it lets you cut a note off just a little after it hits this line and that's what the that's closer to what the nes was doing like uh if you want to actually like the nes was actually every song was running like i'll show you if i mute everything this is how fast my track is going right now this is the pace like every line um and you can change the pace with your tempo here but uh what the nes actually was let me just copy this the nes was full blast all the time so this is what the song would look like and you'd have a super long pattern and then if a song was going this fast, you wouldn't need to use something like SC1 to get a tick uh, further before it cuts the note off. It's going this fast. So you could just like in between these two notes would be like 40 lines. So you could just put the, the note cut 40 or sorry, like 38 lines down. And the basically what they're trying to do is they want the note to cut. They want it to to be they want the volume cut, but they want it as close to the next note as possible. So. This is just, you can't write a song at this speed. Oh God, this is going to be awful. Ah! Jesus. So let's put that back to a sensible pace. So in order for me to get the notes to cut closer to the, the next note that comes up, I would use something like SC1 or SC2, which is cut it two ticks away. Yeah. And so that's what it sounds like. I mean, if you... Okay, here's what this series is going to be about. What if I just remove them? Do I have the whole column here? Removed. Here's what this bass line sounds like now. So the only thing differentiating a note is the initial attack, which is um, not a lot. So you add those back. And uh, what is the SD1? Okay, SD1 is a note delay. Like here, this is just to explain myself. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it up to you to sort of keep track of this stuff as it comes up for the rest of the series. But SD1 is a uh, note delay. So what the SC or what S basically is is like delay something, delay when it gets cut or delay when it actually gets played. So uh, this is something that Jake Kaufman actually showed me personally when I managed to get a hold of him on uh, AIM, AIM Messenger program or whatever, way back in the day. And uh, he showed me if you if you add something like SD1 and then SD2 after, what it does is it actually simulates uh, like playing in triplets or, or like a triplet note or something. So uh, what I'm using it for here is just a slight delay to kind of humanize the... Uh, when the note actually gets played. So if you listen to that right here, um, it's just a little, I'm basically trying to hit the pocket. You know, if you're, if you're listening to some jazz or something, they're all about playing in the pocket, which in terminology means play it a little off, but play it a little off so that you know, it just feels a little cool. You know, like I didn't need to be dead on. I don't need to do that. You know, I'm, I'm too cool for that. So that's what I'm doing here with the drums as well. I want them to play a little off with everything else. So everyone's just a little off at this this section here, which if I remember my 
what is C? C is a pattern break, and B is a pattern jump. So why don't I pattern jump? I basically wanted to just loop this section over and over and over again. At the line 100. But this might not work. It's been so long. Didn't work. Uh, Alright, well, let's try C. What, what do I care? That's going to make it hard to listen. Uh, Alright, so I should just go half. Half will be a little better. This is not entertaining. Whatever. You all know what you signed up for. For fun, for funsies, let's see what it would sound like if I took that out. I'm going to do duplicate the pattern on top and bottom. And uh, top, I'm going to remove all the SD1s, which, again, they're just delaying a note ever so slightly. And now we'll see if there's any noticeable difference. Because I remember when I was looking at modules back in the day, I'd look at it and I'd be like, why did they add that? And I would, I would, because uh, the, the scene, the scene that uh, existed for trackers and stuff, you would share these files with other people and uh, that's how they would play them because file sizes were a problem. You couldn't just send a big 8 meg uh, track, so you would send your actual project file, which the reason why trackers were used is because you just load up all your samples, which would be tiny little loops. Though in my case, they're long loops, but whatever. I'm allowed to because I have a good computer now. So anyways, you would send this track with a tiny file size and people could listen to it that way. But they could also go in, just like I'm doing right now, and fiddle with stuff. So I remember back in the day, I would look at their tracks, um, even like Jake Kaufman's tracks or Vert, as he's known. And I would remove stuff and be like, I don't hear a difference. What what exactly does this do? And um, I'm wondering now if I am also one of these guys that just add stuff that doesn't actually make a difference. So let's hear now if there's any difference with SD1 delaying my notes a bit. So the first one is without, and then the second one is with. <laughs> Gotta add that AO3. All right. No, wait. Uh, let's get rid of that now. Let's, let's hear them both again. slow the pace down if you can hear it. Okay, yeah, you can only really hear it at a slower pace. Alright, let's do them both again at a way slower pace. Dead on time. It's just a hair. It's just a friggin' hair. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing... You add it in. Does anyone hear it? No. But, you know, it's it's if you're trying to recreate something in your head, if you have like, man, I just want it to be a little like, uh, you know, in guitar terms, um, if you were to just play a little hammer on pull off like that is a short amount of time. But if you want to simulate that in NES, you got to add these little things that no one, even yourself can hear at, at pace. Goofy, goofy, goofy. Uh, but man, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. Um, Okay, whenever you see H and then these yellow letters, um, uh, what you're seeing is vibrato. So, let's just listen to those squares. Now let's go back to the normal song, too. So, uh, six is the, uh, the timing of the vibrato, and the four is how, how much depth there is, so how how hard you're riffing on it so if you're playing guitar the six is how fast you're doing this and the four would be how fast or how far you're going you know what that looks like you know what that looks like vibrato so you know you kind of want to simulate here where it's six six two and then six four what that means is like you're starting with vibrato and you eventually get a little uh, a little more intense by the end 
So this is just, if you're hearing a riff in your head. See, like here. It's trailing off in volume, but, sorry, that's annoying. Trailing off in volume, but it's uh, it's gaining in like intensity of vibrato. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, also, kind of one of my trademarks. Damn, so many things I should have probably started with. But one of my ultimate trademarks, uh, the people, the people, always always say they can tell one of my tracks when they're hearing it. Uh, mostly because I add these all over the place. F08, F10. What the hell is going on here? Well, F08 and F10 are, uh, they call them portamento up, um, and an E, sometimes you'll see E08 and E10, uh, those are portamento down, and in fancy terms, actually, they're not fancy, if you're playing guitar, what this is, is a, uh, a hammer-on pull-off, or a, like, slide from one note to the next, so in this situation here, I got a G sharp, and, uh, I want a, uh, hammer-on pull-off in a value of 08 and uh, if you're dealing with uh, this setting here AO3 then um, what's going on here eh. ah. if you're dealing with AO3 um, it means that in a value of 08 is approximately I think it's pro it might be perfect but it, it's approximately it works for me anyways is uh, one fret on a guitar and F10 is two frets, and you have to know hexadecimal to understand why 10 is two and eight is one, but in hexadecimal, you basically count to 16 before you add the next digit, so it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then how do you add six more digits there? It goes nine, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, and that's your, your 16 values, so once you get to 16 or 15, then 16 then becomes 1, and then you count all over again. But, I mean, that's the super fast version of explaining hexadecimal. So, anyways, that, that explains why 8 is 1 fret and 10 is 2 frets. So, anytime you see me doing this, I'm basically note sliding up, and I kind of get carried away with it all the time. See, like, bueno, bueno. Like, it's just how I hear it in my head. If someone was playing it on guitar, they'd want to add a little flare to those notes um then also e10 is note slide down so uh this guy here playing this riff when he gets here he's playing this b and then at the end he just slides his finger down it's a it's a guitar technique but i mean i guess it's i should probably bust my guitar out one of these days so i can show you but um I'm I'm definitely picturing in my head when I'm writing these songs I'm picturing how you would play them on guitar uh and that's kind of how I developed this style um I guess I should just go into a little bit on the drums too um okay so the way the NES would do drums Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Gets me every time. Alright, so I got a couple kicks here. Why do I have so many kicks? And they all sound the same, right? But you can see, they're quite clearly slightly different. Like, if you, if you notice this piece here, why is it all the way down on this one? Like, it's just a little uh, different. And uh, one of the reasons for that is because the DPCM channel, which which plays your samples, because these aren't these aren't like square waves or waveforms. They're uh, they're tiny little one bit samples that get loaded onto the uh, the ROM. Um, and uh, there's a thing, and I'll have to thank uh, Flogiston for uh, explaining this to me. But what what the D in DPCM stands for is delta. Uh, I think delta, but anyways, what what they mean by delta, what the D is meaning is, um, you know, depending on the clock cycle or something to that effect, um, you can change where the um, where the sample begins. Like, does it begin here or up here or up here or up here? So you can start something a little in, 
and that'll give it more of a click or a pop. And, uh, you know, it's not always dead on like that one. You can see I'm pointing at the screen as if you could see uh, this one's way further down for some reason. And uh, the one before it was way higher up. So what I'm doing here is creating a round robin was what they call in like sample sampling libraries. We'll do round robin. So uh, what we're trying to do here is avoid the machine gun sound effect where if you just have one sample and you trigger it over and over again. Um, actually, let's uh, let's just demonstrate that. Whoops. I didn't need to duplicate that. Haggering up my program, or my module, my module. All right, so let's hear what it would sound like if you just riffed the same one over and over again. The machine gun sound effect or effect. Uh. So if this was my kick drum riff, the guy's just um, that sounds super artificial and that's uh, that's no good. But the Nintendo could do this and it wouldn't sound artificial. Now, why is that? Because the Nintendo actually had a little piece of hardware that was doing this delta modulating or, or starting from this delta point. So every time it triggers the sample, even though the sample's meant to be the same, um, it's actually triggering it slightly off, like off in terms of like voltage and stuff, like just a, a hair off. But what that means is, um, it wouldn't sound like this. Um, it would sound like it's constantly, um, it almost sounds human. It sounds human because every hit is just slightly different. That's what you're going for. And, uh, games like Konami games, like, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one, um, there's really shredding, uh, drum riff at the start of the game. Actually, the whole game has shredding drums, but there's there's um, a technique they're using where they're also using the noise channel, which I usually use for uh, cymbals. But what they're actually doing is using it for a snare. And since it's noise, noise is actually just purely random. It's so there's no sample there. They're just triggering triggering some noise. And because of that, um, they're actually getting a, a random sound every time, too. So the, the snare hits that that they're uh, that they're doing sound human as well. So what I did, bringing it all back around to try and sound just a little more human, was um, I made uh, a round robin myself. So I basically have four uh, round robins here. So if I want to, if I want to, I'm not going to worry about doing it in a random way, but I'm just going to trigger all four in a cycle, and then you can hear. That's not a lot. That's not a lot different that you're hearing than uh, the one I had before. Actually, why don't I? While I'm here, it's part of the magic of this uh, this series. The minutia. What? It's only 90. Well, what am I doing? Here? Why is that pattern only 90 rows long? And why didn't anyone tell me? Okay, so the first half of this pattern has the round robin, and the second half has the machine gun sound. Let's see if we can even hear a difference. Not a lot, but what if we speed it up? Okay, so not a lot of difference there, but like one of the reasons I'm, I might have looked a little funny there because I was like zoning because I just you kind of want to uh, listen with your peripheral hearing almost because uh, you, you just want to avoid at least in theory you want to avoid this uh, machine gun effect because that way you can add like a Super fun to watch me do that. Let's go back to the original tempo. That's not it. Boom. Okay. So you can get like a little... When you're trying to simulate a drummer now, doing like a quick little double kick. 
um, you know for sure it's not going to, you just at least know for sure you did everything you could to uh, avoid the machine gun sound effect. And sometimes um, I'll even do this. Damn, it's been so long. It's been so fast at this. Because I used to have to type this in all the time. Um, so now, instead of it sounding like a machine gun, we've got a little variation in each hit and a little volume variation because that's what the uh, the green column here is. V for volume. Um, then also while I'm here, man, this series it's it's gonna start rough, but then once you once you hear or once you get these examples out of the way, it's at least going to uh, it's gonna make subsequent videos easier to watch. So uh, you wonder why. Why am I using 56 and 48 and 52 for my volume instead of anything, 57, 49? Um, that's another thing when you're dealing with 8-bit, when you're trying to be 8-bit or you want to hit, even if you want if you want to recreate some of those nostalgic sounds that Nintendo was capable of doing, you have to know a little about why they sounded the way they did in the first place. And one of the ways they sound that way or one of the reasons they sound that way is because the Nintendo could only have 16 volume levels and that has to do again with the 8 bit when you're dealing with an actual binary a representation and you only have 8 bits to represent a value um that basically means 16 is uh, is all you're allotted uh for volume levels that's why when you get more and more bits you can get more and more volume levels and it's it's exponential i believe so you don't have to add too many more bits to start getting CD quality uh, dynamic. Like we're dealing with dynamics here. Um, so like how dynamic can your track be? Well, it's got 16 levels of dynamic volume. So with uh, with the squares especially, um, you'll you'll see me always using a, uh, a value of uh, 4. So it's within multiples of 4 and it can go up to 64. Um, so 64 blah, divided by four, what am I doing here? What in the hell am I doing here? I like blowing my, own. okay, it is 16. It's been a while since I did some math. I like theoretical math, not actual math. So anyways, that's, uh, that's why, um, if I go in multiples of four and the highest I can get is 64 and the lowest is zero, that's 16 volume levels. So now what I'm doing is I'm simulating the volume levels that the Nintendo was capable of recreating just in an attempt to, uh, like, you know how I also said, if you want to sound authentic, you have to uh, use this on-off method with the triangle. Well, if you want to be deadly, precise, and authentic with your square waves, you also have to do a little effort to um, uh, use these 16 volume levels. And uh, it's only recently that I found out uh, like a little technique. I mean, it makes sense, but once I thought about it, but there's a technique you can do this um, in DAWs as well. You can repre or recreate this uh, 16 levels of volume really easily in Cubase um, if you were to load up these exact same samples I'm using. So bleh. here's a sample. Um, so if you were to load this up into contact or a sampler of some kind, and then just make the velocity uh, all the way so it's 100%, then uh, usually what DAWs will do is MIDI um, it usually deals in 128 instead of 64 as like your maximum. So you would just basically go in multiples of 8, and um, you can hand draw in the volume changes if you want. Um, it's kind of tedious, but uh, there's shortcuts that you can do, like little macros where you can, you can constantly switch with just a, a single key. So that's how you can you can try this, um, which even if you're using synths or or even samples, like even if I made a recording of my voice, um, you could you could also do this technique to get this sort of hard eight bit volume levels. And uh, one of the reasons you might want to do that is because it allows you to do the granddaddy of NES techniques, uh, the echo. Let's see if there's any good ones here. There's one. Okay.
to hear how uh, what happened here is uh, the note triggers again at exactly it it goes from 56 to 48 to 24 right here so this is basically where I want it to echo and um, and then at the end it, it does a last little echo at 16 which is uh, you know just a little quieter and so that's an echo that's an NES echo let's see if I, I could probably I can do better than that that's not a very good example that's not a good example create a pattern boppy boppy ba create a pattern ooh I don't like that I want yeah Fifty six forty eight is just kind of my staple go to standard attack for um, for uh, anything. Basically, every every single one of these notes I hit, you can see I always do a fifty six, and that's uh, I don't have a real reason for that. It's just because if you don't put a fifty six there, it defaults to sixty four, and that's just kind of hard to see. So I start with like the next highest up, and uh, so it starts with the highest up, then the very next row goes to like. Um, approximately, or no, uh, what's the, exactly, uh, eight, like one, two volume levels lower, so it just gives it a little attack. Blah, 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 as opposed to, which has no pluck. Just giving a little sass, getting a little sassy. So, um, a good, uh, you want to experiment with this, but, um, usually I'll go with like half. So 48 was the last note that was hit and I want the echo to be half of whatever the last one was. So let's add some echoes in there. So that's, um. Uh, that's part of the joy of being uh, of using these sort of rigid uh, echo volume settings, but um, I'm gonna just touch on the next technique right now um, because I'm running out of time. Right now, what we've got is the C note echoes because this 24 cuts the volume, so it sounds like it's sort of fading. The notes fading. Um, but what if I want this note to actually echo here? So I've got the 24, which kind of has this fading effect. But I want to add a 16 now, or even a 12, which is half a 24, um, to simulate an actual echo. So or like if you, if you clap your hands in an echoey room, you hear the clap again after, like the sample of your clap, you hear it again. So I want to simulate that. So not only is this first note going to sound like a trails, but it also triggers again later on. And then you do the same here, a little D sharp, and then a little F sharp, or F. And then let's... Let's just trail that off, and cut it. So usually I wouldn't do echo notes this close, but I wanted to make it a little pronounced and then uh when i just do no that's not what i want get over there ah it's been so long you have something to say he's hungry Okay, now, like, if you just want to hear what this would sound like, if I were to use this technique in an actual song, it would sound a little something like this. Son of a gun. See, now it has kind of this lush feel to it, right? So, what does that even mean? What the hell am I talking about? You might be wondering. Well, let's dive back into the magic of audio examples.
let's remove the echoes, but let's keep the pluck because I don't want it to sound artificially different for no reason. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. Here's a faster way to do this. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. So the first half has the echoes, and the second half has no echoes, but it does have the pluck because I want that part to be the same. You might even prefer that other way, depending on what you want to write, but um, that's kind of the fun. That's all part of the fun of making NES music is you almost start with this perfect square, like a perfect square of clay. And um, what you're basically doing with your volume levels and your echoes and stuff is you're carving pieces off that clay and you're making something out of it. And, you know, you might sometimes want to make a straight line or a cube or a pyramid or something that needs not as much carved off. But sometimes you need to get right down in there and, like, just start carving out little hairs and fibers and stuff. And uh, that's kind of uh, all the things I showed you today are kind of that. Um, you start with that lump of clay, perfect cube, and you just whittle away. And uh, you end up with something that is, you know, technically less at the end. There's actually less volume there, but there's more, uh, what, what would you call it? There's more character or there's more... Um, there's just more going on for your for your old ears to process. So that's uh, that's all we got here. Uh, my wife's going to be home soon. And then uh, it'll just be weird if I'm recording here while she's walking around in the background. Let's just dive into what uh, what lies in the deleted the deleted scenes. Oh, my dear goodness. wasn't in the original. Ooh, and this one has no echo. See how I have the uh, echoes here? This is a different technique, actually, where you add the same uh, exact channel to the other channel, but at like half the volume, and that's how you, you can get a different kind of echo there. Actually, as seen directly here, because this one doesn't have the echo, and that one does. So that's an alternate, alternate version. bad. It wouldn't have worked. That's the transition I had to dump. Ooh, but um, check out this drum fill. You can see me using the round robin here. Uh, let me... Don't follow the song. So, you know, that's kind of... Even though you might not be able to hear it, on the odd chance that you could hear the machine gun sound effect, I'm going to make sure there's a round robin in there. Um, and shoot, I didn't even explain how I got those round robins. I basically uh, loaded the samples, um, or I got those samples from actual NES games playing, and I would just cut multiple versions of the sample from different parts of the song because the NES would trigger them with slightly different results. So that's how I got those samples. Noise channel here. It's the same. That's a cool technique. I'll break that down another time. That one you just heard. That's uh, that's kind of similar to Magnet Man from Mega Man 3. It's a very similar technique that I used a lot in the soundtrack. have as much uh, variation you can see how like there's longer chunks here without any volume taken out that's usually what i would do is i would i would write notes first or i'd write the whole song first and then start carving away from that block of clay oh, way different isn't that bass line i was like getting into some weird that could have been a cool bass line on its own had to let her go. Whoa. Yeah, I remember that one. 
weird how it brings back memories. Like, it's just, I'm working on something. It's not working. Uh, you just have to let it go at a certain point. It's the weirdest thing. It's almost good. It's just, it was too much. You can see a really early version here. Like, <laughs> Pattern 19 and like 47 and all that was the ones that I kept, so this was an early version. So the notes aren't the same, but it's, it's basic structure. And me adding, this is fun, um, adding the, um, uh, the bass line here. And this is me just keeping a click track here. And then like, is this good? I don't know. It's so funny, it's like a copyright infringement free version or something. Good. I remember. I remember this. I got like halfway into it. Couldn't seal the deal. These are good, good tracks, man. Oh, okay, this is from other stuff. This is me practicing the echo of the channel duplicating. And that's the boss theme, which I'll show later funny how that's part of this anyways guys and girls that's it for me uh we'll see you guys next time for some more fiddling around